Wow, do we have action-packed news today. Remember what President Trump said? He said this 4th of July was going to be the best one ever. And you know what? It's starting to gear up to look that way. Today is July 2nd, and on CBI News Network, I'm Linda Forsythe. Today we have much to discuss, and um, it isn't just going to be about the tribunals, but what we are going to start out with is an analysis of the transcripts, the highlights for June 19th, 20th, and 21st. Plus, we're going to have a bonus of a surprise transcript, in other words, a highlight from the closed proceedings back in March 26th. And the reason why this is really, really important is because it was just finally released and it has much to do with the names that were taped by the FBI before the terrorist attacks of 9-11. So stay tuned for that. Also, we are gonna have the uh, transcripts available from the DOD website at the bottom of this report. I am going to be reading this report off of, because this is in writing, on our c-find.com website, c-find.com website. At the very bottom of the report are the transcripts, all of them, that you can download. They're all there for you, and you may want to start doing that so you can follow along with the highlights that I'm going to give you. And then after we go over these transcripts, we're going to be talking about the pieces of the puzzle that um, we're going to be putting together. Each piece of the puzzle is actually going to form a mosaic that you're going to be able to recognize. And since it's so close to July 4th, I think it's just about time that, that that picture started to become clear, don't you? And as Q said, you have more than you know. And I'm going to prove that to you today. So let's go ahead and go right to um, our uh, actual, this is on the CBind c-find.com website, and I'm going to be reading this to you. Today, again, is July 2nd, 2019, and the um, what we're going to be talking about is the 9-11 Military Tribunal Transcripts for June 2019. All right, following is a report of the KSM et al. Military Tribunals for the month of June 17th through the 21st. Video analysis is included. Well, that's what this video is. Scroll to the bottom of this report to download the transcripts of these proceedings and review the calendar. In previous analysis, we created a report and a video for the first two open sessions proceedings on July 17th and the 19th. You may view that here, and I have actually the link here for you to click on in this report if you have missed that. That is there for, that is there for you. This report here in the attached video will cover the remaining latest open sessions on June 20th and 21st, plus remove, provide a newly released but redacted transcript from a closed proceeding for March 26th with critical information. But before we give you the analysis, we need you to be aware of the following. Now, who attended the June sessions live? Well, here at Seabine, usually uh, Leonard Bacani and I are the ones who travel across the country from California to Fort Meade and in uh, Baltimore, Maryland, at our own expense to stay at the week to cover the proceedings for you. The proceedings are streamed live via CCTV from Gitmo. In addition, Leonard has taken a week off work each month without pay for the last six months. Our CBI members generously donate to help defray our expenses, but after doing this since January, neither of us can afford it any longer. So we do not have the luxury of mainstream media who covers the expenses of their journalists as we are a charitable foundation created as a grassroots movement for we the people. No advertising and we we are not monetized. So this month, we had uh, trained a couple of our volunteers. And right here, we've got a picture of Bonnie Nirgude. Many of you who are on Facebook, she is, she is so sweet. She, again, took her own expenses, paid for herself to fly to Maryland um, and go to Port Meade to be able to cover these proceedings for you. And so here's a picture of her. And also, we have Linda Huick who uh, also was there and was trained to be able to cover these proceedings. And they were gracious enough to take all week to just sit there and take notes and send all the information back to us so we here could help analyze it. Now, um, what's interesting is mainstream media has not covered these military proceedings even once. These are the pre-trials for KSM et al, standing for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed et al meaning and the others, there's a total of five. Therefore, it has only been us and periodically the Miami Herald that has come out with bits and pieces of anything. 
So what is interesting is CBINE isn't just covering the military tribunals, not by a long shot. We have on our website an entire news section of all different types of breaking news. We have a very large host of volunteers. Many of them are retired police officers or they are actually uh, certified private investigators that help to vet the news before we actually publish it. We have all kinds of editors and we have individuals that take the time to also uh, help be administrators and moderators on our various different areas that you know where people come to discuss and uh, just discuss everything that's going on not only in the news but with the tribunals and so we're actually a quite a large group of people. Not only YouTube is just a very small, small part of it. So in order to continue bringing you this carefully vetted news, we all got together and we decided to create the Seabine White Hats Brigade as a fundraiser to cover our expenses. So in other words, you donate $99 once a year to become part of the White Hats Brigade and we'll send you multiple gifts that were donated from our volunteers that are going to be given back to you, will be mailed back to you. These aren't just downloads. These are real things. And we're all in this together. We're trying to give everyone incentive to help join together and work together for a country. We are patriots. And your gifts are, this is what's really cool, are going to include a one-week vacation, a health discount card, and, <laughs> drum roll, a Seabine white hat. You know, there's a picture of me with that. And so you know, you can go to the actual uh, website, and here at the top in the taskbar of our website is a white hat brigade. You click on that, $99 donation. You receive the three gifts, and um, you just click here, uh, right here, to be able to sign up, to be able to get the gifts. And it explains to you all about the eight day, seven night vacation you have. 3,500 different uh, uh, destinations to choose from. These are not timeshares or sales presentations required. Um, they're, they're just terms uh, Terms and conditions do apply. I believe there's like a $20 thing to activate it or something to this effect. And you have a year to use it. You don't have to use it right away. And then over here, this health discount card, you can already have uh, uh, insurance, health insurance, and et cetera, but it'll pay 75% discount on your prescription medications and up to 70% discounts on lab tests and imaging services. So that also is yours to use for a year. And drum roll, you get to choose between the Seabine regular baseball cap or the actual visor, which is the one I like to wear. So um, all you have to do is just scroll down, want to do this, and fill out the form. That's all there is. And if you would prefer just to send in a check, there's a way to do that where if you don't want to use your card. But let's get back to what we were, where we were at. If you are willing and able to become part of our brigade, we are an army of digital warriors all working together for our country. Okay. So, if you want the transcripts, again, scroll to the bottom of this article to download and a study guide for you to follow along um, with this video or read the highlights below. Let's start right out now. Transcripts highlight for June 19th. Department of Defense, Defense is pushing for more locations to live stream tribunals, including holding them at the Pentagon or even military bases on the West Coast. Okay, I'm really excited about that one. Um, there's just been enough people complaining. It's like, hey, you, you're only having a couple of places. You have Gitmo and Guantanamo Bay and, you know, the Fort Meade military base in Baltimore, Maryland. And there's, uh, they did just recently add a few more, I believe it was runs around New York, and I'm not quite certain where the other one is, but they're going to be adding more, so that's very good news. Defense team continues to question whether September 11, 2001 attack should be considered armed conflict in order to have the trials move to a federal court. Now, the consequences of that decision could be significant. They are put, um, they're basically pushing Judge Cohen to resolve that question soon, and I wouldn't be too surprised if that actually went to the Supreme Court. 
And there's a whole lot that's going on behind that. Uh, but they're, okay, abbreviated. They're saying that since uh, September 11th happened before there was a declaration of war, uh, and there wasn't any actual armed conflict, then these proceedings shouldn't be in Gitmo, and they should be in a federal court. And if there's a federal court, uh, there's uh, a lot they can get away with, quite frankly, because in the military tribunals where there was torture, or excuse me, enhanced interrogation, <laughs> um, that anything that came out because of that would not be allowed. It would be inadmissible in a federal court, whereas that is not the case in a tribunal. So there's a lot more to it. Now keep in mind, folks, these are just highlights, very, very abbreviated highlights. Each transcript is a, you know, well over 100, sometimes 200 pages long. I highly recommend you take the time to read them in more depth. How much does the U.S. Constitution, was another question, apply during court-martial during war times or in combat zones? And the answer was it applies just as much as if it is a U.S. military member during a court-martial. In other words, the right to a speedy trial is taken away. The defense team is arguing it doesn't have access to witness information because it is considered classified. A witness in this case is an FBI or a CIA individual who is a participant during enhanced interrogation or of the alleged terrorist and heard the testimony. It is considered classified information. So this isn't just like regular witnesses in a court proceeding. These are individuals that were there during enhanced interrogation. Okay. They state, there are three tests of punishment as stated in the cases of Brown and Garland to use as precedent from 2006 in Senator Sessions. All rights removed before trial and taking rights away. So it, they were using this as a precedent. I did go back to the motions and read also some court cases, uh, Supreme Court cases, and read up on that. And that was interesting. It is on the Department of Defense website if you are of interest to be able to check that out. Now, there was also a very angry argument of defense attorneys pleading for the right of alleged terrorists. There was a seven, he said, seven years of debate over trial to be held in New York or Gitmo and the rights associated with each. They stated ultimately is a jurisdiction thing. So they're still fighting that, folks. Okay, Judge Cohen, who is the new judge, remember, if you didn't read the, uh, or uh, watch the previous video that we did on the first couple of days. Judge Cohen just took over the beginning of June. There was Judge Perella before that that just um, was reassigned. So his was last month. Judge Cohen came in, and I really like this new judge. This guy's got it going on. He's getting things done. He's getting it done in a quick manner. So Judge Cohen asked the difference between a military, jur uh, military jury or a civilian jury. And Swan says that there is none and to let the military hear it. Okay, so let's move on to the next transcript. There's a lot more to this. Go back and read everything else if you want to know the details. Transcript highlights for 620 on June 20th. There was a surprising network internet outage for a number of hours in Gitmo that morning, stating that the damage originated in Miami, which affected Guantanamo Bay. Gitmo ran on backup generators during that period. That's kind of unusual. Closed session transcripts, um, a defense attorney, a Connell, requested that 802 type transcripts, uh, these 802 is like uh, closed proceeding transcripts, be made available so he can study them. General Martins, who was in attendance, stated that these transcripts were to be posted within 30 days of the proceedings. Well, <laughs> okay, folks, three of the closed transcripts, since this started in Jan January um, 2019 of this year, are still not posted, three of them. And one is from January uh, um, 29th, the other is March 26th, and the other is May 2nd. And what's interesting is all of these were about Al Belushi. Remember Al Belushi, the money man? Okay, Al Belushi wants government to produce witnesses previously hidden because of protective order number four. Prosecution argued for protective order number four to stay in place. This order protects the identity of the witnesses or the individuals doing the enhanced interrogation. Defense argues, how can we determine the credibility of material witnesses and cross-examine them if we don't know their names? 
Okay, so the next point was, defense also argued that the case of U.S. versus Ronald Hodge in 1994 in Washington, D.C., argued on the issue of suppression. So in other words, they're suppressing the names, not only of the witnesses, but uh, information that may be coming out because of the enhanced interrogation. And the court decided that defense had been impeded. Was from the defense feels that this case applies as precedent. Judge Cohen, on the next uh, point uh, we're going to be going over, states, government has to provide witness lists and stated defense should work on what their actual concerns are versus trying to obtain background of witnesses and where they are from. That is something that they are trying to do. And <laughs> well, that's going to be interesting. I doubt that will happen, but who knows. There, um, but they do have to provide a list to the defense team of witnesses. There are approximately 64 witnesses with the possibility of maybe some overlap. The restrictions were brought about in 2017, but there is a 2003 memorandum, memorandum FBI is to assist the CIA in debriefing of defendants and full cycle participation of enhanced interrogation. Defense argues the CIA witnesses will be critical and any statements made during cruel and inhumane treatment should not be admissible as evidence and any statements prior to 2007 should be suppressed. Okay, that's what we were going back to before. The court is arguing prosecution versus defense for two areas of concern about suppression. They need the names and identities of the witnesses or the individuals that were there during enhanced interrogation and information gleaned from the interrogation of the accused. And so these are being withheld to uh, to the defense from the CIA. And so they're arguing back and forth with that. So you can start to see why uh, they really, really want this in federal courts. So some pretty critical information doesn't come out, huh? Okay, so let's go on to the next day, which was really only just in the morning, it was a transcript highlights for the morning of 621, June 21st. Most of the morning, continue to discuss the importance of updating the Department of Defense calendar and all transcripts, closed or open proceedings, in a timely manner to be posted there. Defense team member, uh, member at that time made a notation to the court that the transcripts for March 26 were just posted on the Department of Defense website. Now, when I read that, because again, I wasn't there this time um, at the proceedings, so when I was reading the transcripts after the fact, I about fell out of my chair because individuals who had not been following this from the very beginning and uh, didn't have uh, closely the, the dates memorize from what was what during this time would have just looked at that as just something inconsequential. But no, this is huge. On March 25th is when Leonard Vacani was there at the tribunals and he found out what they were telling them then. So I'm going to move on here. Transcript highlights for March 26th, which was the closed proceedings. Now keep in mind some of these are redacted. I went back to find this, and I had to do quite a bit of searching and digging until I did finally come up with it. And again, it is uh, actually in two parts. It is, uh, you know, part one and part two. Um, each one, I think the first one is 65 pages. And you can see that this is the unclassified for public release. And what is usually put on uh, regular open uh, source transcripts, this is what will uh, be put on the top. And so I'm going to repeat again, for those of you that are new, these transcripts coming out by the Department of Defense always in the beginning state unofficial, unauthenticated transcript. Now, these are perfectly fine. These are made for study. There's going to be misspelled words, possibly misspelled names, uh, you know, punctuation errors, uh, you know, a couple of things that they need to go in there to fix, but they have been closely scrutinized and are deemed uh, reliable in order to be able to use these as a study guide. So when you go back to this one from a closed proceeding, which is March 26th, you can see it has that crossed out and then it's unclassified for public release. Okay, so this is what they, you know, this, we're going to be going over this. And as you can see throughout there, there's certain areas in here that are redacted. That you can't tell what it says. And it's the same thing on the uh, actual second page.
So, you know, I'm not going to go through all of that, but I'm just briefly showing you exactly what it looks like and how it works out. So, going back to where we were. All right. This is C Vine Editor's Note. That's me. <laughs> On Monday, March 25th, 2019, Leonard Bacani was in attendance at Fort Meade to listen to the week of KSM et al. military tribunal proceedings at Fort Meade. On that day, there was discussion about the FBI surveillance that recorded 118 phone calls on 25 lines of terrorist chatter from April to October 2001. Through a voice linguist, they knew who and how and what and where of the 9-11-2000 attacks starting five months in advance. Defense Attorney James Cannell has been under strict court orders, protective order number three, which is what it's called, not to discuss anything to anyone without the appropriate clearance as to the source and methods that three-letter agencies use to acquire their information. Judge Perella, which is the judge assigned at the time, the previous judge, ordered that the motions be put forth by the defense team be conducted in closed hearings the next day on March 26th because of national security purposes. The redacted the transcripts of this hearing were just posted a week ago on the Department of Defense website because of concerns by the defense team of why they were not available, yet it's uh, been like three months later, and uh, well, the others still aren't up. I thought maybe they would be, but I was mistaken, at least as of this, this particular point in time. The other two are not up yet, but we're just going to be going over to this one anyway. Now, here. I want you to listen to Leonard Bacani in front of the White House on March 26th during the closed hearing as it was going on, because of course that's closed to us. And he discusses what he heard on the day before in court, exactly. So I'm going to go ahead and play that for you. Um, for those of you who've seen it before, just sit back, relax. There are plenty here who have not seen or heard it. So here we go. Hi, welcome, Leonard Bacani from CVI News International. I'm here, as you can tell, in front of the White House reporting on the military tribunals at uh, Fort Meade. And uh, at the end of the day, the judge had suspended all further proceedings until further notice because uh, he wanted to have a closed door hearing. In other words, uh, between him and the attorneys, we're going to discuss things of confidential nature, uh, and they didn't want that out in, in, in front of the cameras or the public. So they were going to have closed door hearings, and the judge hopefully will uh, resume the proceedings on Wednesday. I have a direct line to the uh, uh, public uh, uh, affairs uh, uh, officer at the uh, military base and they are going to text me if they uh, uh, resume. We're going to have the transcripts posted on our website c-vine.com. Make sure to go to that and download that uh, after it's been approved by the uh, uh, Department of Defense and hopefully like I said uh, the judge will resume the tribunals uh, Wednesday. So what happened yesterday? Almost the entire day uh, the, uh, he had one uh, a defense attorney, and that was James Cottrell III, prominent in, in, in uh, arguing uh, most of the motions yesterday in front of the judge. What's interesting is uh, James Cottrell uh, is the lead defense attorney for uh, Al Balushi. And if you've been following our Sevine articles and, and uh, videos, you know that Al Balushi is the money man. We know that every time you follow the money, that is where the action is. Not necessarily the head of the organization, not necessarily Mohammed, but Al Belushi knows who's involved, uh, what's involved, where the money's going, and he's the financier. Prior to the judge announcing that we're not going to be any more hearings until they can have a, a secret hearing, or, or at least beyond the purview of the, of the public, uh, one thing that was prominent in that they were talking about things that even James Cottrell could not uh, say. He was under court orders not to argue things or mention things as far as uh, uh, means and the methods of, uh, of, of three uh, three-letter agencies collecting their evidence. 
So uh, what came out yesterday, and this is very important, and this is, I don't know if anybody else is reporting this, but you're hearing it from Seavine. What came out yesterday was that our government knew of the plan prior to 9-11. Let me explain that. Between April 2001 and October 2001, the CIA intercepted chatter from these terrorists. Okay, the, this chatter consisted of 118 calls that they intercepted from 25 different telephone lines. We don't know how many people uh, were talking on each line. It could be one, it could be a dozen, who knows. However, so we don't know exactly to the extent how many people. We do know that a linguist had positively identified these subjects that were in custody as, as being the people behind uh, or, or talking on the phone. So that's interesting, that came out. These intercepts were made between April and October of 2001. The 9-11 attacks occurred in September of 9-11. So they knew uh, the plan prior to 9-11. They, they, they probably didn't know the extent of it um, uh, as far as uh, um, when it was going to occur or exactly where. They did intercept those, uh, those, that traffic. So you're hearing it here. We're breaking it from Seavine News International. We're okay. So let's go back to what we were talking about here. I just wanted you to hear some of that because it is important. So after listening to that, let's start out right in what it said on the March 26 closed proceedings. Again, these are highlights. James Cannell defense requests that there be certain areas as follows, and then it's, as a redacted section, that are classified to become declassified. Situations that do not discuss sources and methods of surveillance. For example, one word changed in a paragraph or reworded totally differently could fall within the criteria for declassification. It was originally redacted because a secure word or words were conjoined together with unsecured information. And the order from um, uh, Judge Perella at that time stated that the issue uh, was now resolved. So they moved on to the next motion. James Cannell, defense. There are three aspects remaining that are relevant to this case for the defense team. Number one, the security classification guide is not made available to us. Number two, there are contradictions in the 2011 classifications from earlier protocol. And number three, parts of CIA being administered by national programs, which uh, uh, places a lot of fingers in the pie. Who in that case determines what is or is not classified? And then Judge Paul Perella, how does any of this relate to your need for a security classification guide in your original motion that you put forth? James Cannell, defense, we need to know the scope of, and then it's redacted, that, well, that's the answer. Also, the classification review process has always been slow. Please speed up redacted classified info posted to the Department of Defense website. Some took up to a year. Better, request better time limits. Cannell then argued at length about the need for a security classification guide in order to understand what words he may or may not uh, say or put together so things, not as many things, uh, become redacted and are classified. Judge Perella said, I'm not even aware that there is such a thing as a security classification guide. Don't think it exists. How could they have a comprehensive guide with so many potential variables? All right. Then on the argument by James Cannell defense, <clears throat> problem of withholding information, for example, is Al Belushi, is he a big player in this, um, in this conspiracy? Could he be arraigned as an accessory liability or require sentencing for a minor role? How do I remedy this for representation if I don't have an understanding of who else was involved? Of course you will say that who else was involved is not relevant. Now, Mr. Trivet, um, I got the feeling that he uh, represented the uh, CIA, uh, maybe the government in some fashion, but the main purpose for the top secret protection of sources and methods in attainment of classified information is our national security. 
We are protecting this by all means necessary and will not allow an ability to chip away. For example, the, the more questions and the more we discuss, the more things are shared by the Defense Council, who then takes a little info here, a little info there, and pretty soon <coughs> they have created an entire mosaic of the whole, which ultimately means they will have an understanding of what the original source and method was, in other words, how they obtained their information. A little later, Judge Farella says, Mr. Connell, we are going to have to take a brief recess. Oh, I thought this was funny. Because of technical difficulties here that we need to remedy. Canal responded with, that's okay, sir. I promise you. I will also have technical difficulties that need resolving, too, at some point. And so Seabine editors note, apparently this is a way they have of communicating a need for a quick bathroom break. So I don't know. I just threw that in there. All right. James Canal, defense, when they came back. The process of protection of sources and methods at all costs are getting in the way of a fair trial trial process of the accused. And then at that point, alarms went off from the cell phone detectors uh, at this point, and it turned out to be a false alarm. <coughs> Excuse me, when you go into these proceedings, whether they're closed or open, anybody who goes in there has to get rid of uh, any type of electronic equipment, no matter what it is, and it has to be locked away. So they have alarms there and they have sensors to be able to tell if anything made it into a room. I, I didn't know that. So Judge Perella states, Judge Pohl, the previous judge, already ruled you have access to acceptable substitutes to do your job fairly. So apparently somehow, even though they don't have the exact information of what it is they're looking for, they give them something that is a substitute that works very well in its place in order to be able to uh, help him do his uh, representation. Okay, now here, this is one part, I'm not going to do this except for anything else right here, is I copied and pasted part of the transcript section uh, of what Mr. Trevitt said, and I thought you might find this of interest. It's not that long. So, Mr. Ben, uh, Mr. ben Atosh was not one of the 19 hijackers on September 11, 2001, and that's not even an exculpatory fact. Neither was Mr. Muhammad. Neither was Mr. Ali or Mr. Banal Shabib. Conspiracies have different roles for everyone. And when you look to the evidence and you look to what, uh, what, uh, what, I, I can't understand that, something or not, they're entitled to discovery. You've got to tie it to the actual charge sheet and what we've alleged. Mr. Benatosh had a vital role in the conspiracy, but all but one of his overt acts is December of 1999 to early 2000. What we have alleged in the charge sheet is that he assisted two of the first hijackers who were coming to the United States to take flight lessons and ultimately later became muscle hijackers and that he ceased, uh, that he cased, excuse me, U.S. air carriers <clears throat> to figure out how to circumvent the security to get razor blades on board so the pilot's throats could be cut. The evidence at trial will show that he did um, so that he then did a casing report and provided it to Al Qaeda leadership, and that was later used to train the hijackers. Who knows what would have happened if Mr. Bin Atash would have gotten caught, wouldn't have gotten, or would have gotten caught, excuse me, had the blade not made it through security, and whether Al Qaeda would have decided that the plan would not work. So he had an important and vital role in the conspiracy, but for the most part, he was not committing overt, and then that word is redacted. It's interesting that Mr. Montrose would make his argument as to why he is entitled to knowing full well that the case law we cited directly contradicts his position. In the Apodaca and Scarpa cases, let me quote from the opinion. A defendant may not seek to establish his innocence through proof of the absence of criminal acts on specific occasions. Mr. Obadaka um, <laughs> made the same argument that he was required to have all of his co-conspirators, and then it was redacted, and the judge noted, the court noted that just because he wasn't on didn't make the evidence per se exculpatory or discoverable, and that ultimately there are far easier methods for him to make those arguments than getting, and then it's redacted. And we are not against that. If Mr. Montrose wants to make the argument that he can ask the witnesses that he put on 
uh, what he put on about that. If he wants to offer a stipulation to the United States, we will look at the language of it. And if it seems like it is accurate, we will stipulate to it. But they don't really want us to do that. They want us to put on a never ending quest for discovery. Just like Mr. Farley said, they are requesting things that they don't even believe exist. Having us play go fetch. It doesn't work that way. It could never work that way. Cases would never get tried if it did work that way. And that is something I have noticed folks that uh, you know, since these proceedings have been going on, uh, just the ongoing dragging on purposely it seems dragging things on for, uh, in, <laughs> I don't know, just inconsequential things is mind blowing. And so um, I'm glad Mr. Tribbett finally br brings that up. James Connell defense, how and when the FBI came across the understanding of who the individuals were on the phone line is very important information. Was it during the enhanced interrogation? How do we cross examine? Who do we cross examine? The government argued yesterday in open court that, and it's redacted, referred in the substituted evidentiary foundation did not come from the black sites, in other words, where they do the enhanced interrogation. That may be true. I have no way of knowing. I can't test that, but it may be true. Mr. Tribbett basically um, went into uh, another long statement of why that is, but it all boiled down to one thing. The government has discharged our discovery obligations, period. Okay, so now, after reading all this, I was rather let down. I just like, I knew that I knew, especially with everything that was going on and how close we are, we are getting to July 4th, that you know you don't see any names floating around out there but then i remembered things that q said q says you have more than you know so i love using mr trivet's example facts and pieces of a puzzle that form a mosaic anybody anybody make mosaics in school it's uh, i used to and it comes out to be beautiful after using tiny pieces of stone or pottery um, so with that being said I'm going to go over some things that have been happening recently, and these are all facts. And we are all digital warriors. We are all working together. Uh, you are, for the most part, uh, the, the jury of public opinion. Okay, so what you say, you can, you, we're going to be presenting different evidence to you and so on, and you make some determinations. Okay, previous Seabine reports created a report of a timeline of events having to do with a Las Vegas attack as being a coup attempt to assassinate Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. Salman is authorized by the king now to manage his affairs and he was named because of significant corruption in Saudi and was tasked with the job of cleaning it up. A couple of days after the Las Vegas attack, Salman had a large majority of the Saudi government and large business owners imprisoned. Most still are. Read about it here. So I have a link right here that you can go to and it goes into great detail. These people are still jailed. They're still jailed um, and that you know he's been holding them there. Now Salman appears to be a good guy. Salman was in Las Vegas at that time at the Tropicana. Okay, he was not at the, the other main hotel where they were saying that the MGM where everything was going on. He was at the Tropicana and they feel that uh, they were trying to assassinate him. And this was just a diversion, unfortunately, very bad diversion. So, all right, go ahead and read that over. Now, those of you who are Q followers will also know what is meant by President Putin handing Trump a soccer ball after a private meeting they both had. Trump tossed the ball to Melania and said, this is for Barron. This is signifying that the proverbial ball is now in the United States court. Now, there's a lot of speculation about what that meant, but those that are Q followers have a pretty good idea. And through uh, bits and pieces that have been proven and so on, is um, I, we believe President Putin gave him quite a bit of material to be able to help Trump 
bring down the uh, deep state, the cabal. And it appears that Putin is just as interested in allowing that, wanting that to happen. Okay, as noted in the tribunal transcripts of March 25th, 2019, we just read that, there are 118 recordings of calls from 25 separate lines taped five months before on 9-11-2001. Voices identified by a linguist and possibly additional means. Now, also, on Fox News Alert, on May 13th, having to do with the 9-11 survivors and family filing a lawsuit in the state of New York in federal court demanding release of the names caught on tape by the FBI, judge was to make a ruling that day. Now, I want you to listen to this again. It's only 60 seconds long, but listen very carefully to every single word that was said. American history with the families of 9-11 victims now before a judge. Welcome back to America's Newsroom. Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm Sandra Smith. And I'm Bill Hemmer. Good morning. Those families want the FBI to release the names of those who helped al-Qaeda from inside the U.S. before the attacks 18 years ago. David Lee Miller is live outside that courthouse in lower Manhattan for us. David Lee. Sandra, survivors and relatives of the victims accused the U.S. Justice Department of shielding Saudi Arabia's alleged involvement in assisting some of the attackers. Now, the families are suing Riyadh, claiming that the Saudi government specifically provided assistance to some of those who took part in the attack on 9-11. An attorney for the family says, despite repeated efforts, the U.S. Justice Department has refused to release redacted portions of FBI documents that could allegedly implicate a Saudi government official in the terror attack. Relatives and victims say that they are outraged by Washington's refusal to name names and provide information. Our government is complicit in a cover-up that is still going on today, and we are being, as victims, we are being re-victimized because our government has not been compliant in forthcoming with these documents. The Justice Department is citing national security interests as one reason some of this information has not been released. Ultimately, a judge is going to decide. A hearing at this hour now taking place in the courthouse behind me. But, Sandra, it has now been 19 years, nearly 19 years, since the attacks of 9-11, and no immediate resolution is expected, at least not today. Sandra? We'll continue following the developments there. David Lee. Okay, so that we played that before, but this again is for those that are new to this. Okay, when I had saw this on May 13th, I had gone back a couple of days later to find out what the judge's ruling was, what the circumstances was, and I couldn't even find where the trial, uh, the proceedings had even happened. And so I went to go do some searches for the, uh, the Fox News alert that I just saw here, and I couldn't find that anywhere. I could find nothing, no matter where I Google searched or I used DuckDuckGo and I tried everything, there was squat. So I had one of our licensed investigators uh, look into this. I said, please find out. It should be a matter of public record or something. Um, you know, where did this, these proceedings take place and was there a ruling? He couldn't find anything either. So in some way, shape or form, it was suppressed. Okay, then on June, oh, by the way, that link that you had, I had remembered, I had sent that link over to Leonard Bacani on the day that I heard it on May 13th via text. And it's the only reason, the only reason I have that link. And it's not any, it's not searchable anywhere else out there. Okay, going back, June 17th in Gitmo during the 9-11 military proceedings of KSM et al., all seats were empty that were reserved for 9-11 family members and victims, which is very rare. And all these years since 2001, that's the only time, there's been only one time that that has happened before. Very rare. And also, the new judges, there are new judges and commanders of Gitmo are replacing previous. KSM et al. proceedings are moving forward in a very timely manner. A very, very different uh, ball game happening right now. Okay, the closed proceedings from March 26th were just posted on the DOD website. January 29th and May 2nd are still missing. All have to do with Al Belushi and suppression of information of various types. Okay, June 13th, 2019, this is a biggie. Hear this. 
UK minister signs off on US request to extradite Julian Assange. Interior minister has certified an, an extradition order. There was a Q post a while back that said that by this July 4th, you're gonna be seeing somebody you haven't seen for a very long time. Now there is speculation that it could be, uh, you know, JFK, it could be John Jr. Um, but I personally think it, uh, well, it could be both, but I think it has very much to do with Julian Assange. Keep in mind, Julian Assange is the reporter, the hero, as far as I'm concerned, that did that huge data dump just before the 2016 election. And those of you that took the time to read through some of that, and hopefully some of you saved that, there is information there. Again, we have more than we know. So if you had any of that, I would take the time just to go back and look through that, and you will uh, probably have definitely an onslaught of things to look through. And then there was another data dump. Um, they said it was uh, from a death switch in case, you know, something happened with Julian, that another one came out. It was, um, I don't know, about, what, three months ago, uh, approximately that. And so there is that also. So that's just something to very seriously consider. Now, next point, Ben Salman met with Trump three days ago. Ben Salman met with Japan's Abe earlier today. Trump was the first sitting U.S. president to ever step over the demilitarized DMZ <laughs> into North Korea. That in and of itself, that one thing was so huge. There's 60 years of war and a country divided, and we were literally on the brink of nuclear war and probably would be in the middle of World War III right now had Hillary been elected because they so want us to go to war. Yet Trump completely defused that and is continuing to defuse much, much more. Remember, Trump promised a magnificent 4th of July. And so all these, um, you know, President Putin and, uh, you know, everything, everybody's meeting with everybody else. Trump just went to the EU and so on. I think it's very much as a, as a uh, video I had done before on the day before D-Day, that, that D-Day that just happened was very much our D-Day. All this was going on behind the scenes. It may not have been loud. It may not have been large booms and et cetera that you heard with gunfire and, and bombs and everything else. But nonetheless, a whole lot was going on, and many of our allies and people that have just become allies are all working together to take down the new world order, to get rid of corruption, and to bring back life in the way that I believe was meant to be lived. So that's happening here really, really fast. Okay, now, as of this note, another emergency meeting was just called. And the EU, the EU Security Council had been urgently convened just after Putin and Pence had canceled their respective events to head back to their headquarters. Something major is going on. I heard that there was a Russian sub that uh, some sort of an explosion went off and there were some killed. There's right now there's a lot of conjecture and a lot of rumors. Keep in mind, you have to keep your heads up. There's potential of a lot of false flags. Uh, the, the, the devil's raging folks, you know, knows that it's going down here. And so you need to be, they're not going to go down quietly. You need to be on extra alert. But everyone is working very, very hard behind the scenes. And that's why we need you patriots all to band together and step up for your country. But last but not least, Q posted three posts on June 27th. Be ready was the first one. The second one, he talked about future comms that were going on right now and that were going to be coming about. And the third was for God and country, patriots fight. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a physical fight. We'll have to see. But there are many ways to fight that is just as effective. Seavine uses the pen as our sword. Okay, now is this enough crumbs or pieces of a puzzle put together for you to start seeing the potential of a mosaic? Where we go one, we go all. Make America great again and keep America great again. God bless America. I'm just going to play this. <laughs>